The Your Safe Space podcast is recorded on Wurundjeri land. This podcast acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the land. Always was, always will be, Aboriginal land. Welcome to Your Safe Space, the podcast. I'm your host, Adele Marie, and this podcast is here for you. It is a safe space for us to catch up each week to discuss anything and everything. And on today's show, we are doing an AMA on air or an Ask Me Anything But On Air. And happy Friday, everyone. I hope your week has been a good one. We have recently had International Women's Day as well this week. So, I just wanted to mention that because I know majority of the Your Safe Space community are women and I hope that you celebrated yourself or that you celebrated the women in your life too. If you are new here, this episode is our short, sharp, juicy one. So it's a little bit shorter than the other episodes that we do on a Sunday and I actually take the questions that you guys ask me on Monday night on my own Instagram, which is at Adele Marie. Follow me if you're not already. And I give you my hot take, but I do have to tell you that this podcast is not a substitute for professional mental health support. And if you do need that, please check the show notes because there are lots of resources there for you. Now, without wasting any time, let's jump right into it. We have another mixed bag of questions today. When I put the questions together for the episode, I try to pick like a variety of stuff just so they're a little bit more applicable to everyone in the community. We have a moving question, a burnout question, and then I tell you guys a dating nightmare story as well. (laughs) But question number one, my boyfriend is moving two hours away and I don't know if I should move with him. What would you do? Thank you for sending this in. Two hours away can put a lot of pressure on you guys and can put a lot of pressure on your relationship and can put a lot of pressure on you making this decision. I also think you asked this question in a very sneaky way and I like how you did it because you said, what would I do rather than what should I do? And like everything, I never want to come on here and tell you guys what to do. I like to hold the space for you to figure it out yourself. And I want to hopefully give you some tips and tricks to be able to find that clarity for yourself. Now, the other thing I want to say is I think I'm a bad person to ask this question to because I feel a bit biased in this. I have no, I guess, tie to a location. And what I mean by that is I've moved states before. I could move states again. I am having like a frequent thought and I don't think I'm going to do it, but I'm thinking, should I move to Queensland at the moment? Like that's just how flippant I am with like moving things away. And I also think there's the privilege that I have of the fact that I can work from anywhere. So when I'm like weighing up that decision, it's probably not as stressful if you don't have that same luxury. But if I remove my own bias, what I would do in this situation is weigh up the benefits and the costs of this decision. Okay. Now I'm going to give you an activity and this activity is my favorite, favorite activity of all time. I don't know if I've mentioned it on the podcast. I've definitely mentioned it on my Instagram before, but this is what I do when I'm confused about a decision or when I have to make a hard choice and it just feels really cloudy in my mind. Now you do need a journal for this or just a blank piece of paper. I'm going to open this in a second. And so what you're going to do on one side of the page, you are going to write down the benefits of moving with him as the heading. And on the other, you're going to write the cost of moving. And then you want to draw a line down the middle. It's almost like a pros and cons list. Now, I've done this many times. And the last time I did this activity was when I was deciding to move back to Melbourne from Sydney. And I'm actually going to run you through it because this piece of paper here, I brought it in. This was written in, when was it? March of 2021. It was an activity I did with my psychologist. If you're watching on YouTube, I literally brought the same piece of paper in. It's her handwriting as well. And at the top, we had written leaving Sydney, and then we had put benefits and costs. Now I'm going to read through each side, not so that you can copy my ideas, but I want you to figure out what your benefits are and what your costs are. And you'll be able to see how some of the benefits and costs have more weight to them. So I'm going to read you the costs first, I think. (laughs) So this is my mindset when I was leaving Sydney. I hadn't made my decision yet. After I did this activity, I made the decision. So the first one is the first cost, a risk that it will be really hard and not successful because I was going to be changing jobs and I moved to a different role, but within the same company. The second cost was that 
uncertainty, leaving what I knew for the unknown. My third cost was how will I see my psychologist? (laughs) I was really worried about that. For everyone playing along, we do telehealth now, so I still see her. And then I had put being isolated at work with less resources because I was going to be the only person in the team in Melbourne. And that was a big concern for me because at the time I was really successful at my job in Sydney and I was just worried about leaving all my workmates behind. And then I had put a 20 to 30% possibility of failing in this move And my psychologist had added a note saying, past behavior suggests even less. But then we had also put a 100% chance of it being hard because I was essentially going to be leaving a very secure job in Sydney to go back to Melbourne, obviously to see my family and we'll get to the benefits in a second. But I was going to start from scratch again. I was going to have to build new clients. I was going to have to build new relationships. I was going to have to start with zero sales to my name and we had put a 20 to 30% possibility of failing. But when I looked back at every single corporate job that I had, I never really failed. I always hit my KPIs. And so that's why she had added past behavior suggests even less of a percentage. Now to the benefits. So these would have been the good things about me leaving Sydney. The first one, having the support of my friends and family and getting to see them often. The second one, if I pull this off, building the business for the company I work for and building my career there, my career would benefit from it. I would feel at home again. And we had put at home in quotation marks because I was so incredibly homesick at this point. And I had been like craving this feeling of feeling at home and I just wasn't getting it. And I knew that if I moved back, I would get it. And then the last benefit was it would fulfill my desire to go back home eventually. I had always known that Sydney was going to be a short-term thing for me, but once I had written everything out, I realized that what I wanted to do was come home because the costs in my mind seemed so much heavier than what they really were once I put it down. And the benefits actually made me feel so much nicer when I wrote them down and when I read them through. So I want you to do that for yourself and I want you to sit with it. You don't have to do this in one go. If you want to think about it for a few days and come back and add some things to each side of the list, once you've written the list, give it another few days just to let it settle and take another look at it before you make your decision. Again, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to wish you luck and I hope that that activity can bring you some comfort. And what I would also love is for the community to come into the Facebook group too. And let us know if you have moved to be with a partner. Let us know if you haven't. (laughs) Some people might be listening to this and might think, I could never do that. That's okay as well. There's no right and wrong in this situation. And to this listener, please let us know what you ended up doing. I think you asked this question about two weeks ago from the day of recording. So I would be very curious to know what you did. All right, question number two. I am feeling burnt out at work and I want to reduce my hours, but I don't know if this is the right choice. And I think this listener deserves a bit of a shout out because the fact that they are already aware that they are feeling burnt out is a huge thing. A lot of us usually or can struggle with even acknowledging that. And I feel like that you kind of answered your own question in the question because you literally said, I'm feeling burnt out and I want to reduce my hours. That is your answer. And I still want to unpack it a little bit more because I feel like to a degree, feeling some stress can be normal, especially at work. Feeling stress at work can be normal and can happen occasionally. But when it's extended over time and when it's prolonged, that can be a really clear sign that you are experiencing burnout. And so for me, the first step is always to create that awareness and identify it and what it feels like so that then you can put in measures to fix it and prevent it from happening. Now, for those of you who don't know, the definition of burnout is a state of emotional, mental, and often physical exhaustion brought on by prolonged or repeated stress. It is most common in our workplaces, but it can pop up in other areas things like relationships, parenting, any type of caretaking situation. And if you are listening to this and you think you may be experiencing it, you might be feeling some of the following. So again, whenever I give you stuff like this, feeling 
things like this in moderation is okay and here and there is okay. But if it's repeated, that's where it could be a sign of burnout. So the first one is a loss of motivation. So really losing that enthusiasm. It might be even just feeling really slow and sluggish, waking up tired, even if you had a really like deep long night sleep. And even if you went to bed early, it could be even subconscious behavior where you start to take longer to get ready or maybe you leave the house later and that in turn increases your chances of running late. The next one is your inability to focus. So things like focusing and paying attention become really difficult and even experiencing forgetfulness and being distracted really easily. We've then got feelings of exhaustion, tiredness, anxiety or sadness at work. And if you're feeling those repeatedly and then the last thing is that you may start to have physical issues and that's because sometimes burnout can actually manifest in our bodies and show up in physical issues. Things like headaches, chest pains, muscle aches and I don't know if you guys remember this, I think I told you when I was going through it but around, it was like May last year, I was under quite a bit of stress at my corporate job and I started to get dermatitis breaking out on my face and I had dermatitis all under this eye here. I had it on both of my eyelids and I went to the doctor and we couldn't really put it down to anything. She said, oh, it could be a seasonal thing. Mind you, I've never had dermatitis in my fucking life. <laughs> and we had not that we were going, well, I mean, we were going into winter, but I had, I have lived in Melbourne my whole life. It's not like I had never been through a Melbourne winter before. And it's quite funny, but the second I started to alleviate that stress and pull back in my corporate job, that dermatitis started to clear up. And I mean, I had the dermatitis for like a good month or so, and I was using steroid cream as well, but I to this day think that it was stress that caused it. So it can definitely play out in your physical body too. I will also do another episode on this down the track because I feel like this is a loaded question, but my advice for this listener would be to definitely reduce those hours and look to also see if you can find the source of the burnout because I think I mentioned it in the stress tips in the AMA episode that I did. The Band-Aid stuff can be really good to help you manage it, but unless you're figuring out the source and combating the source, it will still keep happening. As always, I say it's okay to do the things short term to help you to kind of get you back to that better baseline. But if it is a deeper issue, that definitely needs to be dealt with first. And I also actually recommend this listener chatting to their GP because they'll help you identify some other pathways and maybe even some causes and explore different coping methods for you and help you navigate any of the challenges you might be experiencing. And I also just want to add good luck, be kind to yourself, be compassionate to yourself and remember that that self-care is not just a bubble bath or a face mask or a hair mask or burning a nice candle. It is about your relationship with yourself and how you treat your physical self, your mental self, your emotional self, and your spiritual self. And it's a regular practice of looking after yourself in every single way. So good luck and let us know how you go. Again, if you guys have experienced burnout, come and chat to us in the Facebook community. We love hearing and sharing your thoughts too. Question number three. This is also a loaded question. <laughs> what is your advice on getting your boyfriend to help out more? Cleaning baby bottles, washing, etc. Now, this one really needs its own episode because I feel like it's so layered. We have an element of communication happening. There's an element of parenting, an element of traditional gender roles, and also something that is called the mental load. Uh, I just want to say thank you to this listener for sending it through. For this purpose of this episode, I'm just going to talk through the communication point on this one. Otherwise, we might be here all day. Now, it is totally acceptable and reasonable to ask for what you need, especially in a relationship, especially when you're living with somebody, especially when you are parenting with somebody. And I'm just assuming with this topic that you live together and obviously baby bottles, I'm assuming that there is a baby involved. I also don't know if you have been already asking for this help and nothing has happened, but I'm going to give you some of my tips and what I would do if I was in this situation. The other thing I want to mention is I have some lived experience with this. So I lived with an ex in Sydney for a few years and then the ex after that, when I moved back to Melbourne, I would stay at his house frequently. We did some lockdown weekends together as well and both of them did actually pull their weight. Mind you, there wasn't a baby. I didn't have bottles to clean. 
or things like that. But with washing, cooking and all that stuff, they really both did pull their weight. But I've also then dated men who believed in those traditional gender roles and traditional roles where, you know, the woman in the relationship does everything. And I did have to have some of these conversations with them. And another layer to it is I have even seen it in my own household with my dad. I love my dad so much. He is the best dad ever. But again, he grew up in a very old school generation, traditional gender role house. He was raised by Greek parents in a family of four boys where his mum did absolutely everything for them. And so I've even seen it in our household, him being the only man, my mum, me, my sister, where for a long time he didn't really help out. And obviously that has shifted. We're all grown adults now and we've had to have some hard conversations, but I definitely think it can change and I definitely think it is possible and I think communication has a lot to do with it. So let's get to the advice. This advice could also be for everyone, not just for your partner. Maybe you need to communicate something with someone at work or in your friendship, or maybe you just want to ask for your needs to be met. You could still use this advice. The first tip is to get clear on what help you need or on what you want. So be very specific about it. Write out everything on a list of what you need. Be straight to the point. Instead of just saying, I need more help, be very specific. And you have in the question, maybe it's asking for help emptying the dishwasher. Maybe it's asking to clean the baby bottles at this time on each day. Or maybe it's saying, can you please do a dark load of washing every Thursday? Be very, very specific. Sometimes you might have to even give him a demo on how to use the washing machine. That's okay as well. It is really important in this to let go of the idea that other people are mind readers and will just assume what they need to do. And I say that, especially if you have already been doing it for a really long time and they are used to you doing it for a really long time, it can take time to obviously change that behavior. The second tip is to listen to my asking for what you want in life episode. And that one has more practical tips when it comes to communication, but that will help you book in a good time to have the chat. And it means asking if it's a good time to have the chat. It is not asking in the thick of a fight or after a stressful event. It is making sure the timing is right. It is making sure that you use lots of eye language and neutral statements and explain what you want from the list done and keep that communication communication, clear, kind, and assertive. So in that episode, I speak a lot about assertive communication, and I think you can get some real benefits from that one too. Tip number three is to work to each other's strengths. So I know that for some couples, one will cook, one will clean, and there are certain tasks that people will naturally be, I guess, better at or more inclined to do. So figure that out as well. And it also looks like letting the help, like allowing the help. Because I think especially if you have done it for a really long time, or especially if you're used to doing it a certain way, there is an element there of letting go and just allowing your partner to step in and step up and sitting back and letting it happen. And also it's okay to explain what like standard you want something to do. And that's if it's not already clear, but allowing them to do it the way that they want to do it too can be helpful. And then tip number four is to practice gratitude. Again, this goes both ways and you might be rolling your eyes at me being like, Adele, he doesn't even thank me for doing the bottles now, but there is science behind it. (laughs) And the science behind it is if you want to reinforce a behavior, you have to reward it. So when they are doing something to help you saying thank you and paying that gratitude to them can help them repeat the behavior as well. And then my last tip is to really practice sharing responsibility. So that means setting up and giving that responsibility to your partner when you're not around to either help them get more comfortable with it, build that skill and habit up and really starting small and knowing that over time, the new habits will slowly start to form too. And then my last point on this is as long as you bring up these issues and communicate in an effective way, you should be able to come up with a solution. I think living with somebody is hard. Parenting is really hard. I will get my parents on this podcast eventually so we can have a chat to them about how they navigated parenting. But we are really just figuring it out as we go. And I think especially if this is a new relationship, the first baby that you guys have had, there is still time for you to figure it out. And I want to say good luck 
And again, if you are listening and you've been through this and you have tips, please come and share them. Obviously, I haven't covered everything in this episode. I would love to do another episode on this. So yeah, come into the Facebook group and share them in the community too. And then our last question today, and I feel like this is quite possibly my favorite question ever because I've got a funny story. Well, it's not even funny. It's embarrassing, but I'm going to tell you is this, how to not feel guilty about seeing and dating more than one person at a time whilst I'm single. Now, firstly, I currently do this and I've spoken about it a few times on the podcast, on my YouTube channel, even on my Instagram and TikTok. I will tell you the funny story in a second, but I do this because for me, it feels good for me and it works for me. And it is something that I figured out with the help of my therapist would prevent me from repeating past behavior. So very quickly, I'll give you a bit of a backstory. In my past relationships, I was somebody who fell very quickly for people and who would date one person at a time. And what that led me to do was basically become consumed by these people that I was dating. And then I would literally have a boyfriend the next minute. (laughs) And I'm saying it so flippantly like, oh yes, it would just happen like that. But that is literally how it would happen. And when I look back at every single past relationship that I was in, aside from the most recent one, which wasn't even really that recent, but I didn't really have that autonomy and that decision making come from me. I was just being like, yeah, if they want me to be their girlfriend, I'll be their girlfriend. Like there wasn't any kind of onus on me. And that pattern, did it really serve me? No. Did it work well for me? No. And so I've been trialing and I have done this even when I started dating again before the last relationship. I did the same thing. I do it now. It works for me. It feels good for me. As I'm explaining this, obviously, I know that it's not for everyone and I'm not telling you that this is the only way that you can do it. There's a million ways to do a million things in life. And if you don't want to do it, by all means, don't do it. But if you do want to do it, here are my tips and my thoughts. So the first one, if you are single, There is nothing wrong with seeing multiple people at the same time. I think as long as you are upfront and honest about it, there is no reason to feel guilty. If that guilt is too much for you to handle though, then maybe that's a sign that you are not someone who's suited for that. And I'll give you an example. So a little, maybe it was like a month or so ago. Yeah, a little over like three to four weeks ago, I had a date on a Friday night and I think this date was from Hinge. Anyway, I was getting ready for the date and I got a DM from someone that I had been on a date with last year. I didn't really want to go on this date anyway, but he asked me what I was doing that night and if I wanted to go out on a date with him. And I said, no, I'm literally getting ready for another date. And he... (laughs) He replied to me saying, you're blacklisted. And this is not the funny story, by the way. And then he eventually asked me out on another date, which I said no to because I wasn't interested. But if someone is to ask me, I'm never going to be dishonest about it. And it's not like I would go and like rub it in their face because I think that is a bit of a different thing. But if I'm single and I'm not hurting anybody and I'm very clear in my words, I'm very clear in my actions, then I'm I know that my conscience is not guilty and I think it's very different. If I was sitting here confessing my love for one guy, telling him, yeah, I love you and I can't wait to spend the rest of my life with you and then still going on other dates and that would be a little bit different. But I think it's totally acceptable to keep things casual and there is a big difference between like being shady and saying one thing and doing another. On that, you might also have people who don't like that. And then they will assert their boundaries on that. And that's okay too. They are allowed to assert their boundaries. I've never had any of the guys I've dated. And I mean, I guess I'm in a bit of a different predicament because I will share when I'm going on dates on my YouTube, I share it on my TikTok. So if any of the other guys I've gone on dates with, they would know that she's going, oh, she's going on another date. And I've never had any of them raise it as an issue. And I've also not had that be the reason that the relationship hasn't progressed. The reason the dates haven't progressed or that the relationship hasn't progressed is because we're not the right match. And it's been other reasons, not that one. My second tip is to know your intention. So my intention when I do this is to get to know people and to find a relationship. And your intention might be having fun. It might be keeping it casual. Your intention doesn't need to make sense to anybody else. For me anyway, dating more than one person is different and not comparable to sleeping with more than one person. I have been in both camps 
and I'm not shaming anybody. I think different people will have different needs in their lifetime at different times. And with casually dating now, that's what it is. I'm not actually sleeping with multiple partners at once. Again, not saying that I have never done that, not saying that that's a bad thing, not shaming you if you do that. But for me, that wouldn't feel very good. So I date in the way that feels good for me. And I also have to add, if you are somebody that is sleeping with multiple people at the same time, please use protection and please get regular STI screenings as well. Tip number three is I like to also assume that they are doing this as well. And you guys would see it in some of the dates or in some of the situations that you may have found yourself in. Most people who are single are casually dating more than one person at the same time. And I always assume this unless we have a conversation about exclusivity or boundaries and things like that. Tip number four is to find balance. And I say this because you don't want to go overboard. You don't want to have 20 people texting you at once or planning 20 first dates at once. At the most, I think I've just, what I try to do is I try to arrange like two to three first dates over like the course of like a week or two and then progress from there. And I've spoken about it before how I would run like my own little like, not my own, yeah, you could call it that, my own little bachelorette, but I would maybe match with a couple of guys, go on dates with all of them. And I'm still having those conversations with them and it's not overwhelming or too much for me to deal with. So, you know, you don't want to overwhelm yourself. And then tip number five is to know when to tap out. (laughs) And in the past when I have done this, so just in that last relationship that I was in, and I'll tell you the story in a second, but I stopped seeing other people when I had feelings start to develop for my ex-boyfriend at the time. And we weren't even exclusive yet. We hadn't had that conversation, but I just knew, I think it was after like the third date that I didn't really want to see anybody else. I didn't want to talk to anybody else. I didn't want to kiss anyone else. I just wanted to spend time with him and be with him. And that is what felt good for me. So that's when I kind of cut it off with the other two guys that I was chatting to at that time. My overarching last thought is if it feels good to you, you don't need to feel guilty. And I would love to know from you guys what your take on this is. I would say most of us do this. Maybe it's not publicly spoken about and maybe it's just something that because I do put it out into the universe or onto social media that people might have opinions or thoughts on it. Come and let us know in the Facebook community. And before we wrap the show, I'm going to quickly tell you the dating horror story. (laughs) So... Uh, I had just moved back to Melbourne. I had been living in Sydney for some time and I had started dating again. I had gone on two dates with two guys. I've I've changed their names. One of the guys, Tommy, he would go on to be my boyfriend, the boyfriend that broke up with me and started the TikTok healing series. And then we had Bobby. (laughs) I had gone on two first dates with both of them. I then had a second date lined up with Bobby. And I remember it was like a Thursday. We were going to a cafe to have lunch and I was driving back from a meeting in the city and with the work that he was doing, he was available like during the day, which was good for me. And so I drove to his house and I had known Bobby for a very long time. So I felt comfortable doing this. And then we got in his car and we drove to a local cafe. I had still been texting Tommy, right? Because we had had a really good first date and he had a reference a second date, but we hadn't organized any plans. And so Bobby and I sit down at this cafe and we have our menus. We're looking at what food we're going to get. We're about to order. The waiter comes out, takes our drinks order, is coming back to take our food order. We're sitting on a cafe outside. I'm facing, I'm facing Bobby And there's a walkway on the right-hand side and then the road on the left. (laughs) We're chatting, chatting, chatting. I look up and who do I see walking towards me? Tommy. While I'm on this date with Bobby, Tommy comes over to the table and he puts out his hand to go say hello to Bobby and goes, hi, I'm Tommy. This is my parents' cafe. What are you guys doing here? So I literally went on a second date with Bobby to Tommy's parents' cafe and my heart fell through (laughs) my ass. Derek is laughing. (laughs) Guys, I wanted to crawl into a ball and roll away. (laughs) So then what happens is we can't get up and leave because we've ordered food, right? So Tommy goes inside that's his parents' cafe. So he's having a catch up with his mum and his dad. And Bobby and I are sitting there. Very, very awkward. He doesn't ask me how I know 
Tommy, he he just carries on. We're having our food. We're having our lunch. We sit there, eat our meal. I'm sitting there for literally 40 minutes, cringing the entire time. We leave. (laughs) I get a text from Tommy maybe, I don't know, three or four hours later. And he says to me, funny seeing you in my parents' cafe. How was your date? Cringe. And I said, oh yeah, it was good. And he goes, let's organize that second date. And it literally did not put him off. If anything, I reckon it triggered like his ego. And I reckon he got a little bit like, oh, she's on a date with someone else. I better probably step up and ask her on that second date. And he would go on to become my boyfriend. That relationship obviously didn't work, but we had laughs about it at the end. But that was my dating horror story. If you guys have any similar horror stories, send them in. I would love to do an episode on that because I think it might make me feel a little bit better, but it might make others feel better too. But we will wrap the show there. As always, thank you for your support. Thank you for joining me. Come and join us on Instagram. Come and join us in the Facebook group. Leave us a review on Apple, a rating on Spotify, and I'll see you guys on Sunday. Bye.